Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Thursday evening to join me. Uh, at the bottom of the screen here, I've got a URL that points to a Dropbox folder. We can download the PowerPoint and the demo file that I'm going to be showing you today. You're not obligated to download it right now to follow along. You are welcome to if you do want to. I just popped that into the chat again for those of you that joined late. So welcome. Um, my goal is to do a demo, do some talking, show you how my demo works, and then answer any questions you have or if you have any specific scenarios that you're trying to work out and wondering if triggers and variables might be right for them. I would love to see if I could help you out with those as well. So at any point during this webinar, please feel free to jump into the chat if you have a question or if you want to um, raise your hand and unmute yourself, you're also welcome to use your microphone if you would like to as well. Okay. All right, looks like everyone's muted. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. So here's what I'm hoping to cover today. This is going to be a storyline focused demonstration. Triggers in Captivate are called advanced actions. Variables are still called variables. You can do basically the same things in Captivate you can do in Storyline, but obviously different software, it's going to be a different workflow. Uh, so today, focusing on Storyline, I will open with a demo of a Storyline, a published Storyline file that I created that I threw some triggers and variables into. And um, I'll give you the finished uh, version of what it looks like to be able to use triggers and variables and what they can do for you. Then I'm gonna give you a, a short lecture on triggers and variables. When I got started with variables, they're they're a little bit hard to understand for me, especially when I was looking at um like HTML coding, JavaScript coding, I didn't quite understand what they were. So we'll do a very short explainer of what triggers and variables are and what they can do and how they work. And then I'll go into the raw version of my storyline file and I'll give you the back end view of um, how I put that storyline file together. We'll talk about troubleshooting your projects, basically how to get your own triggers and variables to work. I've got some tips for you. And I'll give you some examples of how you can go farther with triggers and variables. Um, before I move on, do you have any burning questions at this point? Please feel free to put them in the chat box. Or you have, if you have something in mind that you really hope I'm going to cover today, please put that into the chat box. I see that we have some late arrivals. Uh, I do have the URL still open at the bottom of the screen here. They can download this PowerPoint and practice file. I'll have it again at the end of this presentation as well. I'll put it into the chat one more time for those of you that came late. And again, it will be available at the end of the presentation as well. So as a reminder, please do put your questions into the chat as we go through. I'm happy to stop and answer those as we go. Okay, no questions or comments. Let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, so let us open up my published storyline file. Uh, you should see a big screen that says Saguaro National Park. This uh, project that I created, I really just did this for this webinar. It's not an example of great instructional design. It's just an example of an e-learning e that uses triggers and variables. So it's not effective as a learning experience. It's just something fun that I created. So let's go through this and I'll point out the instances where triggers and variables are making something happen. So first example, of course, if you're here, you probably have basic storyline skills. I've got a button here, the button has a trigger. It's just going to send us to the next screen. If you're in 520 or you've taken 520, you're familiar with um, probably being able to use a text entry box to put in your name, the username. And then once they submit, that name becomes part of the tutorial. This is a nice uh, example of the personalization principle um, from Mayer. It's a nice way to uh, personalize an entire tutorial for your user. I always recommend don't go overboard with uh, using someone's name, but it is a nice touch. All right. In this e-learning, I set it up so the user can choose their own character. Again, this is just a, a demo project. I didn't go really far in implementing their character, but here the user can choose if they want to be the adorable coyote, the ridiculous looking cactus, or the cute little quail. I'm sorry, they're all cute. I started a theme and I just couldn't stop myself. So they can select here. You can see that an outline appears when they click on it. Also notable 
Um, the other two deselect when you choose one. So that's um, something that I set up in Storyline as well. Uh, so that's um, a couple triggers going on here, as well as uh, another instance of a variable. Uh, the character choice is stored as a variable in Storyline. Of course, I have triggers making the next and back buttons work as well. All right, so I chose my character in the last screen. It appears here. Uh, my name appears here in the little uh, text caption as well. And I've got a menu of things to uh, explore in this tutorial. Okay, so this is the initial message that my, my chosen character spits out. Um, as the user goes into each uh, once the user completes one of these sections, this content, again, just dummy content, it's just a, a quickie e-learning I put together. Uh, the message changes here. So that's something else I have programmed in using a uh, trigger and um, states. So I said, where do you wanna go? Now they visited one module it says, what's next? Lindsay again, still using my name. Um, and then I have a trigger and a variable, several variables set up. Uh, I don't need to go through all these little items here. Once the user visits all three modules, um, a little item will appear here. So let's go through these pretty quickly. Doo -doo -doo. All right. So now that the user, me, has gone through all three modules, the message changes again for my little chosen character. And I've got a new button that opens up for a trivia game. I haven't programmed out the game yet. I'm actually gonna do a whole webinar on gamification. I'll probably build this out for that. But if you go there right now, which is under construction. Um, so that's the end of the demo that I have. Uh, you can see that there's some interesting things that happen more than just next and back. Um, if you take an IT505, you're in IT505. Uh, we learn to use storyline. You kind of start with doing some really basic interactions, um, some really basic effects like, you know, being able to hover over something or when you click on something, something appears. Uh, those are just using triggers. They're pretty basic. But when you go a little farther and use um, states uh, or uh, variables, you can do a little bit more with your storyline e-learning. And there's ways to even go even farther that we'll talk about in just a moment. So let me minimize this. Let's go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint for a moment here. All right. So I'm sure a lot of you, or at least several of you, already are pretty familiar with triggers and variables. If you are, I apologize. I'm going to go over these in, um, in brief. If you're not familiar, hopefully this is a good short introduction. Sometimes triggers and variables can be a little tough to wrap, wrap your mind around. If you go on YouTube, there's a lot of storyline explainer videos that you can look up that'll give you kind of uh, a different perspective. So this is the way I explain these things. This may not be the best way for you to understand it, but please go out and explore the resources. And I find that if you have a couple different sources, several sources um, explain the same topic to you, that can be really helpful in understanding it and really uh, embracing what the concept is. Okay, so in Storyline, triggers are statements that make something happen. They're statements that you program, like they're like logic statements. Storyline calls them triggers. They're basically just logic statements. If you're coding, it'd be like a line of code. But what's really nice about Storyline is that it's all just, you know, you just click to make things happen. You don't have to do any hand coding. Now triggers are statements. Variables are just little bits of stored information that can change value. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. So use variables in conjunction with triggers. Triggers don't need variables, but triggers can use variables. So variables are just something that could be used in a trigger to make something happen, depending on the value of the variable. All right, so what can triggers do? They can do all sorts of things. Um, once you start using Storyline, you start using triggers very quickly. You know right off the bat, they can be used to make buttons, to jump to a specific slide. Storyline has layers. You can show or hide them. You can get a little bit more complicated. You can change the state of an object. You have to uh, create and design the states of an object, of course, to be able to use a trigger to change a state of an object. So you get a little bit more complicated here. You can adjust a variable. That's really important for... Um, uh, using variables and making the most of them. Uh, triggers can implement a change depending on a variable's value. You can uh, program in an if statement into a trigger. So you have your base trigger, and then there's a whole section below that says if, and that's where you put in the logic basically that 
it'll only make a change if a variable equals something that you are wanting it to equal and more. So triggers are just statements. And of course, we'll look at these in just a moment in the back end of um, my storyline project. Now it's triggers. Variables are used in conjunction with triggers. So as we saw in the demo, variables can store your user's name. They can store your choice of a character or an avatar. Uh, they can store whether an action is complete or incomplete. For instance, I had something happen once the user visited all three modules. I actually used uh, several variables to make that happen. I'll show you how I did that, but it can store that information whether something is complete or incomplete. It can store numbers. I mean, you can do uh, simple calculations if you wanted to. You can do custom quiz games or trivia games, and you can do so much more, but those are the, the basics. All right. So I wanna do a little explainer of what a variable is. Triggers are pretty straightforward. Uh, variables can be a little bit more hard to wrap your mind around as I, as I mentioned. So a variable is basically just a container. It's a container that has a value and that value can change. So again, just in the, in the name of the item here, variable, the information stored in it is variable, it can change. And that's the value of a variable is that it can store a bit of information that the user inputs or that the user did, it can track that. And you can use it in trigger statements to make more interesting things happen. Okay, so here's my big example here to explain variables. I'd like for us just for a moment to imagine this cookie jar is a variable. So again, a variable is just a container that stores something. The cookie jar is a container that stores cookies. Okay, so if we think about the cookie jar as a variable, the cookie jar has lots of different values, right? It could be the type of cookie. Maybe you want to store whether it's chocolate chip, peanut butter, oatmeal. Maybe you wanna write a software program that monitors the cookie jar in the, the staff break room and uh, tell you what kind of cookie is in there at any given time. I don't know what's possible. But those are some possible values. Other possible values are really simple. Maybe you just want to know if the cookie jar is full or if it's empty. If I recall, the first um, webcam I believe ever created was actually installed in a break room to monitor a coffee pot so that people could know if there's coffee available or not before they went to the break room. So I guess that's all another thing. Coffee pots full or empty. Fun fact. All right. So again, Variable, I'm focusing here. Cookie jar is a variable. It has lots of different values depending on what kind of category of values you want it to have. And you decide what value you want it to have. It's totally up to you. Okay, so I'd like to do a quick interactive with all of you. If you could please go into your Zoom menu. Um, I think it's in the, the toolbar, find your reaction buttons. There's like a little th thumbs up in there. There's a raise hand, there's a heart. There's a few different things in there. So go ahead and find those because on the next screen, I'm gonna ask you to use them. I'll give you just a moment to find those. Oh, and while I wait for you to make sure you all know where your reaction buttons are. Uh, Caroline, there is, um, there's basically no limit to what you can val uh, program a variable to be. There's probably a character limit. You're only gonna be able to um, store text information, like, you know, characters of a word. So if you have like the word water is five characters, you could probably store an entire paragraph. You might be able to store like an entire essay, but you're not really gonna be able to store any other information besides just the plain text. But what you wanna store in there is completely up to you. Good question. Okay. Here we go. All right, so referring to the image on screen here, if the cookie jar is empty, show a heart reaction, use your heart reaction. If it's full, show a thumbs up reaction. Okay, thank you, Autumn. You got the thumbs up. We got a bunch of thumbs up. Beautiful, you're all here. I love it. Thank you so much for participating in that. All right, so you all, uh, went through a trigger with me. You showed the example of how a trigger can work. Okay. In this case, the cookie jar was full, so participants showed a thumbs up reaction. Uh, let's look at this broken down here. All right, so here is my example. If the cookie jar is full, show a thumbs up reaction. If it was empty, I asked you to do something else entirely. So if we were to be using something like this in Storyline, here's how it would break down. The variable name would be 
cookie jar, you name your variable. I actually, I don't think you can have any spaces. So it'd be cookie jar, but all mashed together with no space. The value in this case, I was looking to define it as either full or empty. I was looking for it to either just have one of two values. And the trigger was give a reaction depending on whether a cookie jar, whether cookie jar's value is full. And I didn't actually break down here that um, there was an if statement here, if it was full or if it was empty, you're supposed to go one way or the other. So it's a little bit more complicated of a trigger. Um, so does that, does that make kind of sense to all of you as an example of a variable with the values are tied or that can be tied to a variable and how that trigger works? I'll go ahead and pause for a moment. Does anyone have any questions? That's the end of my little short explainer for this. Genevieve, yes, great. Reminds me of Excel, yes, it's um, very similar to Excel. If you've done anything advanced in Excel, there, you can do if then statements in Excel. Basically all coding kind of comes down to statements like this where something's supposed to happen depending on what a variable is and you can build things, you can scalpel things, you can make it really complicated or you can try to keep it really simple. Okay. So just to recap, a trigger in storyline, again, storyline calls them triggers, but you might just call this, you know, a, a line of coding anyplace else. Or again, in Adobe Captivate, they call them advanced actions. And storyline, a trigger is just a logic statement that implements an action or a change. And it's always going to be tied to an event. So it's going to be tied to something like a user action, like they clicked something or they dragged something. You can tie it to a timeline. It can be the slide timeline. So how far um, the timeline is along a slide. It could be the timeline tied to an object. Maybe if an object doesn't appear until five seconds in, uh, you can tie it to the, the timeline for that object. It can also be tied to a change in variable value. Uh, that can be a little tricky to implement depending on um, how your trigger statements are organized. And there's lots more, there's lots more. And we'll look at a couple in the, the demo here. And if you have questions at the end of this uh, webinar on specific examples, we can talk about those. Okay. Uh, Sasha, we are not going to post this recording, but if you email me, I can um, uh, send you a, a link to the recording. So all of you that are in this presentation, if you want a, a link to the recording, just email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, we're not going to post it publicly though. Okay. Uh, types of triggers. Okay. So again, to recap, um, triggers can be used to jump to something, show hide a layer. Uh, they can be used to create uh, light boxes very easily. They can move items. They can open URLs, change the state of something, adjust a variable, so on and so forth. So. What's really key and really useful about variables, my PowerPoint's moving on without me, is that um, you can tie in an, an if statement that'll only implement a change or action depending on the value of a variable. And you can program all of that out yourself. Uh, so variables, they store text or numbers. Um, you can store quite a bit of text or numbers in your variable. I'm sure there's a character limit. At a certain point, the storyline program might crash if it's more than like a couple thousand or something. But you can store basically essays, pretty long um, uh, strings of text in variables. But you have to define it as one of, of one of three things in storyline. It's either text, true or false, or um, a number. And those are the allowed valuable values for the information that can be stored in your variable. Um, the fact that you can choose true or false, this is kind of just a little shortcut. I mean, you can define this on your own using text. You don't necessarily need to have this built in. You can also use true and false as a number. You know, one is true, zero is false. You can just lean hard into your binaries if that um, is something that makes you happy. But these are the three that you are allowed to choose from in Storyline when you set up your variable. And we'll take a look at that. All right, further examples of variables, again, recapping here, it can be a user's name. You can track whether a section is complete or incomplete. You would track whether a section is complete or incomplete by setting up a trigger uh, that changes a variable once a section is complete. And then you can have another variable that tracks whether all the sections are complete. Again, it can get kind of complicated. Uh, and you can also um, do something like choose a character, choose an avatar to follow along with you throughout an entire e-learning. Okay. So let's go back into my file. We'll look at the back end here since we looked at the published version and we'll see how it works. 
Okay. So be, don't be overwhelmed. I got kind of a lot here. I'll just start at the, the very beginning. Okay. So I'm zooming in a little bit so you can see the whole slide here. I've got um, some zoom things in my way. I'm just gonna move those over. Okay. So again, the minute you get started with storyline, you become familiar with triggers because that's how you make buttons. Of course, there are buttons that are programmed into storyline itself, into the player. I've basically removed all elements of the player and I just wanted to use my own custom buttons. I always recommend if you're using your own buttons, disable the player buttons. I don't wanna see two next, two back buttons. It just gets confusing. But you can see here from the very start here, I've got my let's go button and this is a trigger. I'll open this up. This is obviously a very simple trigger. And by the way, I'm using Storyline 360. If it looks a little bit different in Storyline 3, that's that's why, but it all works the same otherwise. Um, so Storyline helpfully has a trigger wizard. Here's the action. I'm having it jump to a slide. You can choose what slide you want it to jump to. I'm just having it jump to the next slide, which is a 3.2 name collection. And it's only going to trigger when the user clicks on the object, let's go. And I actually went down here and I named my shape, let's go. It's a good good tip if you are doing a lot of variables and triggers to go into your timeline and to name all your objects. And it's really easy. If I cancel out of here, you can just change the name down here in your timeline. I know it's probably really small on your webinar screens, but you can just double click, oops. My mind's going different places here. You can just double click down here and change the names of your objects. And that makes it really easy when you go up here and you're programming your triggers. It actually automatically changes the name up here as well. It makes it really easy to find the object on your screen that you're looking for. This title slide's really simple. There's only four objects on it. Uh, but if you have something like you know, 20, 30 objects on a slide, it's hard to find. It makes it much easier if you name your objects because otherwise it has a default name. Like, um, let's go ahead and... Uh, put in a, a shape. If I just put in another shape, for example, it's just called rectangle one. So if you don't name your objects, they're just gonna be rectangle one, circle one, text caption one, not very helpful if you're trying to program your triggers. Sorry, I'm laboring that a bit, but let's go ahead and um, move on. Okay, so here on this slide, I got my username variable set up. Again, if um, your advanced storyline at all, you, you've already seen this in action, or if you've gone through 520, maybe you've seen this in action. This is pretty easy to set up. Uh, storyline does you a great service when you set that up as it basically sets it up for you. And I just customized this so it made more sense to me. So this is the text entry box and you can edit the text in here to say whatever you want. And that's what the user will see when they um, uh, have the published version of this open. And you can see the trigger to the right here for this text entry box. It's gonna set this variable username equal to the typed value when text entry loses focus. So this is an automatic um, item that's set up. I'll show you how I did set it up. I'll delete that so I can show you. Uh, you'll actually go into input here, go down to data entry, and you'll put in your um, text box right here. And you can style it, you can make the, the text bigger or smaller, you can resize the box itself. If you don't like the way the box looks, you can go into format and you can make it look however you want it to look. Um, however it looks, most significantly, it automatically again sets up uh, the trigger automatically. And the default variable is called text entry. So what I wanna do to make this make more sense for me is I wanna create a new variable, um, it's already in here, but let's create a whole brand new one. Uh, I'll just say first name. I wanna create a new variable so that I know exactly where this information is going to go and then it makes sense later on when I wanna set up my own trigger or um, reuse this information elsewhere in my project. So to set up a variable, uh, I went into here in the variables box. This is the, um, the variable menu right here. It's this little tiny, manage project variables button here. You open that up, it shows you all of the variables in use in your project. To create a new one, just hit plus. You can name your variable whatever you want, no spaces though. So I'm gonna name this one first name. As I mentioned, there's three uh, formats of information that your uh, variable can hold. Um, 
number limits it to numbers. It can't hold anything else besides numbers. Text, I'm pretty sure you can mix in numbers with that as well, or it can be true, false. This one, I'm gonna make text. On the default value, I'm just gonna leave blank because I expect them to put in their name for me. I don't want you know someone else's name to be in there, but I'll follow up on that in just a minute. So I hit okay there. I hit okay here. And now to make sure that I'm clear on where this information is going to be stored, I'm gonna store the user's first name in the variable first name, okay? So the default text entry, I think can get a little bit confusing later on if you're um, trying to reuse this variable. So I wanna make sure that goes to first name. And here's how you uh, test this out. This is actually really bothering me that I left made this blue. So I'm gonna make that back to a, a plain white. Uh, so here's how you would actually test out and make sure your variable is working. I'll, I have a little troubleshooting slide I'll cover later on, but let's um, make this easier to see. I can actually take the variable, the information they put in here that's gonna be stored in the variable, and I can display it on screen at the same time. It might make more sense if I just show you how this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert a reference to first name here. So you see there's just a little percentage uh, symbols that go next to it. You can type this in yourself if you want to. You don't have to go to the menu and insert. Uh, it's just a convenient thing to make sure you have everything spelled correctly. And then I'm going to go ahead and preview this slide. So you can see what I'm, how I'm troubleshooting this and making sure it works. Oh, this is kind of small on screen. I apologize for that. Um, so you can see right now there's nothing down here. Name is blank. So if I set this up correctly, when I put in my name and I click away, the variable is now storing the name Lindsay. So one important way and quick way, quickest possible way to test your variables and see if they're working or not, is to actually put them on screen somewhere in a just a testing kind of way so you can see if they're working or not. So now I know I can move through the rest of my e-learning development knowing that this variable works the way I expect it to. And again, this is just for testing. So now I'm gonna take it off the screen so that when I publish this, the user doesn't see it. See it. You can actually store all sorts of things outside the screen here off the slide. The user won't see them and you can keep them there for testing if you want. Okay, so that was a lot of talking. Are there any questions at this point? Feel free to unmute or pop them in the chat box if you like. If any come into your mind, please don't hesitate. Okay, let's go to our next screen. Uh, so see, I've actually changed this variable. So I'll change it to, to first name because that's the, the user's name now. This is my choose your character screen. This screen is more complicated. The variable I chose to store the uh, user's choice, I actually named it avatar. It probably would make more sense if I named this character <laughs> since I'm telling you all to choose your character on screen, but this is just how my, my mind worked, I guess, when I set this up. Um, this screen is a little bit complicated because I have layers here as well. I'm gonna be doing a webinar on visual design. It might be the one that I'm doing uh, next, next month. Um, to deselect the other items, was once one is selected, I actually put put them on uh, a layer and it makes it makes it hide the other items. Anyways, that's a whole nother thing. Any case, I did not make these characters. I stole these from the internet. They're just clip art. Hopefully I didn't do any copyright violations, but <laughs> just throwing it together for this webinar. No, these are super cute. I did not make these. Um, okay, so I dropped in my three characters here. And again, down here in the timeline, I made sure that I named them. So quail is named quail, cactus is named cactus, coyote is named coyote. Again, cannot reiterate this enough. It really, really helps if you name your things in your timeline, if you plan on using them in triggers later on. Okay, and then what I did was I set up a slide layer for each of these. And what I did was, I'll actually just, um, that all together. I actually just took the um, character from the main screen. I copied it. I always use keyboard shortcuts and I can never figure out when I use the mouse shortcuts uh, <laughs> where it is in the menu. And so I created a layer for each of these and I just pasted on the character and then I added the um, glowing format here, the glowing effect, I should say. I can't remember which one I chose to say it was that one. And then I have these layers set up so that the other layers are hidden once the user clicks a different character. So that's the way that I set this slide. Um, let's open this up. 
that's the way that the other characters deselect once I've selected one. This is not really related to a trigger. Well, it is related to a trigger in that the triggers are um, showing the slides. And then I have the layer set up so that the slides deselect once the user clicks something else. So that's how I made that function work. Because um, otherwise, if you just have that selected state for each character, if you just use states instead, they'll all look like they're selected and then it gets very confusing. I'm probably just rambling at this point. All right, so in any case, here's what I did. I set each character so that when the user clicks on it, it shows the respective layer and that's it. That's a very simple trigger, right? Um, and then what I did was I went into the variables. I already created the avatar variable, which is um, off the screen here. You already saw that. Um, what I did was is once that layer shows, that's where I put the trigger to set the value of the avatar um, variable, okay? So on this layer, they've clicked on coyote. The coyote selected layer comes up and how I set up the trigger for the variable to change is you just go in here, select adjust variable, already had avatar set up. So I selected avatar and this is actually just free text. I just typed in the word coyote. So I know in my head that I have three values that are possible for the avatar value for the avatar variable. It's coyote, quail, or cactus. Um, so I just set adjust variable avatar to value coyote when the timeline starts on this layer and that's it. And that's the whole thing. So basically as soon as the, layer, the user clicks on coyote on the base layer, it brings up the next layer, the coyote layer. And this is where the avatar variable is set to the correct value. And I did that for each of the other two characters as well. Um, if they open up the cactus layer, it sets avatar to value cactus. If they click on quail, it sets avatar to value quail. And if they change their mind or go back and forth, it doesn't matter because it'll just keep on changing that variable to whatever layer is currently on screen. Okay. And then again, you can test this by putting um, a little box on screen with the variable uh, in it. And you can make sure that this is working the way you want. So as I click on each of these, the default value is actually um, coyote. Um, if they click on cactus, it goes to cactus, go to quail, it changes to quail. So pretty neat, right? You can just put the variable there up on screen and make sure that it's working. Because again, the variables are just bits of text information. And if you know that they're working and the text is changing, they know they're going to work in your project itself. So great way to troubleshoot there. Okay. And final slide. I know this is way too complicated and I probably have way too many uh, items set up here. But the way I made the character selection work was I went into, um, I, I pasted in the coyote uh, clip art first, and then I went into its states. And it automatically has a normal state, right? So every uh, image you put into Storyline has a normal state and that's the default. But I added two new states and I named them um, quail and I named them cactus. You can call the states whatever you want. Um, when you do add states, there are uh, default ones that are already built into Storyline, but you can create ones all your own if you want to. And in these two states, I basically just deleted the coyote clip art and pasted in the quail clip art. And then for cactus, again, deleted the coyote, put in the cactus. So how I have this set up when the user chooses their character is that I have um, three triggers here on this menu slide that change the state of um, this item. And again, in the timeline, I named it avatar. It, it's probably confusing that I have the variable and the item here, the same name. But anyways, it changes the state of the character, the avatar to quail when the timeline starts on this slide, if the variable equals the value quail. Does that make sense? So you just use states. It seems kind of complicated, but once you get those states set up, you want to set up the states first. And then you go in and choose uh, the trigger items, change state of avatar. Again, it helps if you name your, your items here and also highlight some as you hover over them. So I know the coyote is named avatar. Uh, change it to state quail. And it has um, these items here that you can choose as well once you've set up the states. When the timeline starts on this slide, if the variable, again, you can choose your variable here, equals the value quail. So 
it helps to have the states and the, the variables kind of name the same things because then it's very clear. Quail is going to be quail, cactus is going to be cactus. The only confusing part is that the default here is um, called normal for coyote. So I did set this one up to change state of avatar to normal when timeline starts if the avatar value equals coyote. Okay. So again, you can set these things onto your screen so you can make sure that they work. Um, how I set up the module completion, there's lots of different ways, I should say, for setting things up in Storyline to make triggers and variables work the way you want. There's no one perfect way to make things work the way you want. Creative people come up with all sorts of creative ways to make things work. So what I did to make the, um, uh, the trivia game button pop up was I have my project set up. I tried to be really organized that I have my my whole project broken up into scenes in Storyline. Uh, you can see here is a button that says new scene. This is the starting scene. It's just a nice way to be able to group your content so that it helps you kind of see how it's laid out physically. I like to say that humans are very physical creatures and we like kind of seeing how things progress and it helps us keep our um, frame of reference when we're in a tutorial to kind of know where we are. So it also helps when I'm developing this if I have things broken up into scenes and I've named the scenes as well and I've also named the slides within each scene just to keep it really straight. So real quickly here the way I set this up is of course when the user clicks on each of these there's a trigger sending them to that scene and what's nice about sending them to a scene rather than a specific slide is that for some reason if the intro slide changes in that scene that's okay they're just going to the scene whatever the first slide is in that scene that's where they're going to go and then in that scene itself i don't have anything exciting on the first slide but on the last side of these scenes i have it set up that um there's a trigger that adjusts a variable uh, so that the project is tracking what that they've completed this section. So for each scene, I named each scene, and then I created three variables, one for each scene that correspond and track whether a user has um, gotten here or not. So for example, I created the value getting here for the section, the scene getting here. I, I set it to true or false. The default value is going to be false, but when they make it to the last slide on this scene, the variable is going to adjust getting here to value true when the timeline starts and that's it. I'm not using that variable in any other way on this slide. I'm just changing the value to true. And again, you can test that um, here. I'll go ahead and preview the whole, uh, actually, let's actually copy this. I'll put that here. So you can just see the, the, the variable will change here. So this is my um, landing slide for the scene. Section complete variable is false. When I go to the next one, section complete is true. So I know that that variable is working the way that it's, it's supposed to. Now, the way this works for the uh, main home menu is a little bit more complicated. So I have one variable set up for getting here, I have a variable set up for things to do, and I have a variable set up for plants and animals. So that's three variables, one for each module. Once the user completes each module, its respective variable sets to true. The default is always false. Once they finish it, it's set to true. And let's see here. Um, I set up a fourth variable. Are you ready for that? I named this one game unlocked. The default for game unlocked is false. And my goal was uh, once they visit all three modules, that game is going to unlock and that button's going to appear on screen. And this is where I say, where did I do, where did I put that little rectangle? I don't know where it is. Oh, I remember where I put it. There it is. Okay. <laughs> Again, these things can get really complicated if you're just setting them up um, willy nilly. Okay. So as part of this text caption, I set up states and how this trivia game button appears. Let's keep that up on screen here. <laughs> Remember where I put it. Um, this only appears when this trigger is good to go. So this is how complicated triggers can get. Um, so 
It checks to see if each of these three variables is true or false. If all three are true, it changes the, the meta variable game unlocked to true as well. Okay, so that's important is that you have to change that variable value first. Once all those three are completed, it keeps on checking every time the user comes back to the menu, it runs every time. Once all three are true, it's gonna change this variable to true. And then I have another variable where it's gonna change the state of this caption to the state name game unlocked when the timeline starts if game unlocked value equals true. Now, one thing that can really trip you up in this menu here is that the more complicated it gets and the more triggers you have, sometimes your triggers are out of order and they won't go correctly. Uh, so it's really important that, for instance, this trigger is listed after this one um, so that it's activated correctly. When this slide loads, Storyline goes through each of these triggers, starting with the top one to the bottom one, and it, it uh, activates them in that order. So sometimes if your triggers are out of order, the wrong state will happen. For instance, on this caption, I've got three states. If I have these ordered incorrectly, the wrong state is going to show. Okay, I've done probably way too much talking. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and just wrap it up real quick and we can talk about any questions that you have. Okay. Oh, the change of the color of menu buttons. Good question. Someone asked about the color of the menu buttons. So Storyline has a couple of options for states. When you go into edit states, there are built-in states in Storyline or you can define your own. Uh, everything has a normal state. You can add a visited or a hover state when you click this little new state button and you hit the drop down. Uh, these are the ones that are built into Storyline. I added a visited state and I changed the color of this. It's the color I wanted to be when, once it was visited. And I changed the color of it just to lighter blue when someone hovers over it. These are built in states. You don't have to do any triggers for these, which is really nice. Uh, yes, you can drag and reorder triggers. Some of them it doesn't let you, but you can just, you just grab the little like left handle here and drag it around. Um, a lot of the time, if your variable isn't changing the way you expect it to, or if your state isn't doing what you expect it to, usually it's a trigger order problem. So it's important that, you know, you stay kind of organized in your mind that, you know, I have this initial text caption here, for instance, and then I've got a second visit the second time they visit this screen, I want this one to pop up. And then the third thing they're gonna see is the game unlocks. So they're not even in order here, probably cause they're like, I don't know, alphabetical or something in this um, state thing. Um, so it's important that you have these in the correct order to make sure they uh, run in the correct order. Again, this is just like coding. Imagine this is like a big screen of code and everything is gonna go top to bottom, just like you're reading an essay, you go top to bottom and it's gonna activate in that order. So that's usually the problem is that those things are out of order. Yeah, it's really nice that there's, there's built-in items in uh, Storyline. Okay, let me make sure I get all the questions. Yes, you can drag in your order. Okay, great. All right, I've got a really quick um, slide for troubleshooting. I um, showed you how you can put that variable value on screen. That's the easiest way as you're testing something to make sure your variables are changing the way you expect them to. Just put it on screen, they'll change right then and there when the variable changes and you can see if it's working or not. So of course, my advice for e-learning development in general is test, test, test. Just keep on testing it yourself. Um, uh, publish it and make sure that the published version works as well. If you have something really complicated, sometimes there are glitches and you need to make sure you know about those before you send it off to the client or something. All right, so I showed you this in my project, use text boxes to display the values for testing. You can just move them off the screen and your user will never know they're there in the published version. So they can keep those there forever and use them for testing. All right, I didn't create a flow chart, but I really recommend that if you're gonna do something complicated, take a piece of paper, take a PowerPoint document, just create a quick flow chart that you know where you want your variables to change and where you wanna put your triggers, they're gonna make something happen. It, it was, it's really helpful if you actually draw it all out in the first place, especially if you're new to it, so that you know where everything needs to go and that you can go in your project and verify that everything in your flowchart has been done because the more complicated things get, 
the more likely you are to miss things or even misspell things or even have something just slightly off in your trigger. Just like coding, the whole thing is not going to work or your whole trigger is not going to work. Your effect is not going to happen unless it's all perfect. It has to be perfect. Like we just looked at, order does matter. Drag and drop those triggers to create the order of implementation. Top to bottom is how they run. Top goes first, bottom goes last. I can't tell you how many hours I've probably wasted, baffled why something wasn't working, and it's because the triggers were in the wrong order. And then my last little bullet point just reiterates the first, test it, test it, test it, test it. Have someone else test it. Trust it in a different browser, on a different computer if you can. Just keep on testing. OK. So. A few tips for you. If a trigger is tied to an object, you can copy and paste the object to also copy and paste the trigger. I can probably show you this really fast. So let's say um, this one doesn't have any triggers associated. Let's say something like this. You probably already found this with um, buttons. If you copy this getting here button and I create a new slide and I paste that button, the same trigger that I had on the other slide came along with it, okay? So when you have um, triggers tied to specific objects, like you had to click on it, then create the trigger, those will copy and paste along with the object. Uh, same thing for slides. You can always reuse your slides. Like what I would probably do since I have the avatar set up here, is I'd probably just like copy and paste this slide and keep on using this little guy. Um, I have the state set up here. So same thing with states. If I copy this and I put this on a new slide, his states will come along with him and I don't have to redo those states and I know they're going to be perfect. So keep note of things like that. You can also copy and paste the triggers as well while I'm on the topic. So you copy change state, the change state, the change state, those three change state avatars. I can um, actually copy all of them and put them onto the new slide. Sometimes the, the full thing doesn't come along with them, so you have to change that. But anyways, um, you can troubleshoot that later on. The point is you can copy and paste, save yourself some time. All right, so if you've done triggers, you've done variables, and you're like, this isn't complicated enough, I need more, you can use JavaScript. There's actually a trigger where it just executes JavaScript. I do not know JavaScript. I am very good at copying and pasting, though, and the Storyline community is very robust, and there's lots of people out there that have done really interesting projects, and they've shared their JavaScript. So you can go out there and Google and see some interesting things. One of the more fun projects I made was... Um, I uh, created a game. It was like a trivia game. And I actually used someone else's JavaScript and their project files. And I um, set it all up so that the numbers from the game, the scores, actually went to a Google Sheet. And then the game pulled them back in so that they had a global leaderboard. So if like five people say we're playing my storyline project from their own computer in their own country, the leaderboard would show the scores of all five people and how they ranked against one another. And it ranked them too. It was really neat. I think it's on my um, website somewhere. I can always share that with you if you're interested. It was complicated to set up, but it used JavaScript and you can get, you can get real complicated real fast. You can also use JavaScript to pull values from the LMS. So like Moodle or Canvas. Um, depending on the LMS, of course, uh, once I got a project set up so I could actually pull the user's name from Moodle without them having to enter it. I thought that was really neat, but it didn't always, always work when I tried to make it run. Um, also really interesting is if you have multiple storyline projects and the user is going to use all of them in their browser, you can actually pass values from one project to another via uh, JavaScript. My Slides are moving on though, me again. Um, and that's use JavaScript to store information kind of like a, a meta variable in the browser. It's called local storage. It's a whole another thing. I had a student do a really neat project once doing that. So that's a fun thing to explore. And again, you can just use lots of triggers and variables to create games and timers and make things that are really complicated. People have done some really amazing stuff using uh, triggers and variables. All right, so quick wrap up here, triggers and variables, make your projects do more. I would say that they are essential for doing any sort of advanced e-learning. If you want to be an e-learning developer, you got to know how these work because they do really cool stuff. And it's a lot of fun too. So um, I probably should put my last bullet here is um, to learn how to do these, 
play with your software. Play is a wonderful way to learn how stuff works and how to make stuff. Just doing this demo, I had a lot of fun making the Saguaro National Park demo. I just moved to Arizona a few months ago. Again, I lived here a few years ago. I haven't visited Saguaro National Park and I thought it'd be fun to make a demo of Saguaro National Park and then make stuff you know, happen in there. And you know, if I polish it up a little bit, I could always use that in my portfolio as well. So play, play with your software, choose something fun and have fun with it. And that's the best way to learn how triggers and variables work. Okay, that's it. I've talked a bunch. I'm finishing on time here. I do have the URL down here again, if you want to download the PowerPoint and my practice file. Again, I'm using uh, Storyline 360, so it might look a little bit different than Storyline 3, but the functions are the same. So we've got eight more minutes. Do you have any questions, comments, things you want me to help you figure out? We have time and I'm happy to help you do that or answer any questions you have. If you have someplace else you want to be, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your evening to join me. If you want a copy of the recording of this webinar, please just send me an email and I'll send you a link to the recording. Let's see, I saw a thing here. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. If you got to take off, I support you. This is off topic, but how do you reorder scenes? I'm going to go ahead and stop recording here.